Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and if you haven't seen me before, my name is Ava, I'm a research assistant at King's and I'm also doing a PhD at UCL. Now this is quite a controversial and emotional topic for some people, so I have to put a few disclaimers so people understand exactly what this video is about and what I'm trying to acknowledge. Firstly, I'm in no way trying to demean the traumatic impact that abuse can have on individuals. As someone who has worked with both child and adult victims of abuse and who is spending their PhD looking at developmental trauma and child abuse, I do understand the detrimental effects psychologically, mentally and physically that abuse can have on individuals throughout their lives. And for this reason, I have put a trigger warning at the beginning of this video and I have also attached some helplines for individuals who feel like they need to seek support after this video. Secondly, I am not trying to defend sexual offenders who have caused abuse on another individual. I believe that individuals who have abused others should be reprimanded in the correct fashion through the legal system. Thirdly, I am not trying to normalise the behaviour of individuals with paedophilic disorder. I am simply trying to state the research and the diagnosis criteria so that we can understand the disorder more. Fourthly, this is a science channel, therefore I am not trying to provide any biased opinions. Any viewpoints that I give is that that has been stated in the research that I am mentioning in the video and to be completely transparent, I have attached all of the research that I mentioned in this video in the description below. It is important to understand that a large percentage of individuals with paedophilic disorder have not acted on these urges and due to the stigma that's been placed on this disorder, these individuals find it hard to seek treatment. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's important to understand the disorder, the research and the diagnostic criteria. A lot of research is biased because a lot of it focuses specifically on sex offenders or convicted paedophiles and that is a lot of the uh, viewpoints and the research that is demonstrated to the public. So I'm trying to give a better understanding as to what the research is and the diagnostic criteria for individuals who are non-offenders but with a paedophilic disorder. It's also important to know that the prevalence of paedophilia within sex offenders is only 25-45% to 45% which suggests that the majority of the people who actually end up acting on urges or abuse children do not actually fit the criteria for a paedophilic disorder. Also, I think it's important to know that a lot of the research I'm looking at is to do with sex offenders, and this is because there is limited research on individuals with a paedophilic disorder who have not offended due to the stigma on disorder, and that means that individuals who have the disorder but do not act on their urges are less likely to seek treatment and therefore be participants in the research. I'm now going to describe the diagnosis criteria from DSM-4 of what constitutes a paedophilic disorder. Firstly, the individual has to be 16 years or over and the child or children in question have to be 5 years younger than them. Therefore, the child or children will be 13 years or younger at prepubescent age. Secondly, over a period of 6 months, these individuals have experienced sexual arousal, fantasies, urges or behaviours to these children or child. Thirdly, these individuals have either acted on these urges or they have not acted on these urges but the urges produce a lot of marked distress or shame in these individuals that have impacted their lives. As you can see, there might already be some stigma to the disorder because individuals who have acted on their urges are placed in the same diagnostic category as those who have not acted on their urges but feel marked distress, shame and guilt from the urges that they experience. The second problem that has been raised by the criteria is that pubescent children are ignored. So individuals who have an arousal for pubescent children is ignored, whereas if they have a, an arousal to prepubescent children, they will be uh, categorised as having a paedophilic disorder. Thirdly, it is hard for clinicians to know that they've experienced this arousal for six months or more because of the stigma to disorder. A lot of individuals do not want to explain or talk about this interest that they may have had for a longer period of time. Right, so it's important to understand the bias in research before I go into the research on individuals with paedophilia. Most research into the disorder has been with individuals who have acted on these urges. And the reason for this is that most of the participants for paedophilic disorder uh, are taken from those who are in the legal system. Due to the stigma of this disorder, those who do not act on their urges do not seek treatment and therefore these individuals are not going to be participants in the research. So you can see already that there is a bias in paedophilic disorder research. Therefore, even though it could be said that research has been done on this subject, no one really knows the differences biologically or psychologically between sex offenders who have abused children but do not have sexual urges and individuals who have a paedophilic disorder but have not acted on these urges and therefore it's important that these individuals seek treatment 
and we are able to include more individuals with a paedophilic disorder as participants in research. Because of this, I am going to try and distinguish the differences between research of individuals who have acted on these urges or have abused children and research on the disorder for individuals who have not acted on these urges and simply feel distressed from the urges they experience. So one cause uh, could be having a comorbid personality disorder. It's been researched that around 47% of individuals who are paedophiles have an antisocial personality disorder. Another researcher who looked at individuals who are paedophiles but have not acted on their urges suggested that the prevalence of an antisocial or borderline personality disorder was between 33 and 52%. Secondly, it's important to look at abuse history. The research so far is inconclusive and we cannot know for sure how much having a childhood abuse history really impacts the risk of developing a paedophilic disorder. Some research suggests that sex offenders who have had a childhood history of abuse are more likely to show paedophilic tendencies. However, this link is substantially lower for non-offenders. The link between child abuse history and developing a paedophilic disorder is also moderated by a lot of environmental factors. These factors include the type of attachment that the individual had with their caregiver, the sex of their caregiver, the type of abuse they experienced, whether that was more neglect, physical or sexual abuse, um, whether they experienced a lot of neglect when they were a child. So yeah, there are a lot of different factors regarding the type of abuse, the duration of the abuse, for example, um, as well as attachment difficulties that they may have experienced that moderate this link between having a sex abuse history and having an increased risk of developing a paedophilic disorder. And obviously this risk seems to be higher in those who are sex offenders compared to non-sex offenders. However, this link really um, has a lot of contradictory research, so it cannot be validated right now. It needs to be validated more. Thirdly, there has been some suggestions that there is some sort of genetic predisposition to paedophilia and that is because the prevalence of paedophilia is higher in those with a first degree relative who also has a paedophilic disorder compared to those who are paedophiles but have a first degree relative who has another kind of paraphilia disorder or depression. Now that I've talked about some theories on some general causes of paedophilic disorder, I'm now going to explain the difference between acquired paedophilia and developmental paedophilia. So basically, acquired paedophilia is an abrupt change that is due to something that has occurred in their brain, whereas a developmental paedophilia is more to do with the criteria that I suggested earlier, where an individual experiences this urge gradually over six months or more. So it is not an abrupt change, it is something that develops over time. Also, individuals with acquired paedophilia may show general differences as well regarding impulsive behaviour as well as general hypersexual behaviour that is not just related to children. And therefore, they are seen to be more out of character as they have this abrupt shift to a more hypersexual personality, whereas individuals with a developmental paedophilic disorder having this more of a gradual urge, specifically for children, with less... Um, kind of other impulse behaviour issues are less likely to look like they are out of character. So now I'm going to go a bit into the neuroscientific research that has been done on paedophilia. So an fMRI study that looked at neural responses found that individuals with a paedophilic disorder show similar neural responses when they looked at pictures of children as heterosexual males who looked at pictures of females. Another fMRI study that looked at blood oxygen dependent levels in the brain found a typical response pattern for individuals who had a paedophilic disorder when they looked at sexual stimuli of children. As there is limited research that has been done on large scale studies for paedophiles, I'm going to now look at a review that looks at case reports of people who had an acquired paedophilic disorder. So some individuals acquired paedophilia after it has been discovered that they had a brain tumour and the brain tumour did not just um, change their sexual preference, but it also gave them additional symptomatology, which included personality changes, hypersexuality generally, and impulsivity. This suggests that the neoplasms or brain tumours that they had led to unspecific disinhibition, which allowed affected sexual experiences and behaviour, increasing the risk of sexual abusive behaviour. Some other individuals who had acquired paedophilia had this after a form of dementia, such as frontotemporal or vascular dementia, 
and this also included personality changes, obsessive, compulsive or impulsive behaviours or aggressive behaviours. So this again was not specific to sexual behaviour to children. Acquired paedophilia after Parkinson's disease also did not just arise sexual abuse but also marked hypersexuality in general. However, when this was medicated with dopamine agonists, there was no further psychiatric or neuropsychological abnormalities. So this suggests that the brain pathology can lead to paraphilia-like behaviour like paedophilia without changing an actual existing sexual preference and this can be monitored with dopamine drugs in this context. In this context, medication that affects dopamine levels has repeatedly been shown to alter activation of brain areas involved in reward and motivation and this may be one of the reasons why it affected these individuals and reduced their symptoms of sexual behaviour towards children. Again, you can see similar results with individuals who had acquired paedophilia after further neurological disorders and this is that they showed general hypersexuality that was not specific to paedophilia even if they did show um, have sexual abuse towards children and they also had changes in their personality, impulse control and had other neuropsychological deficits. So those are some case studies on individuals with acquired paedophilia and you can see quite a lot of the results are similar that individuals who had acquired paedophilia after some sort of brain disorder also show differences in personality, impulse control and hypersexuality in general. This review also looked at CT scans and found that childhood sex offenders had abnormalities in the temporal regions of their brain that is associated with disinhibitive behaviour. However, these results really cannot be translated to individuals with a paedophilic disorder because we cannot see the difference between those who have offended and have not. Secondly, the MRI studies that have been reviewed are on single cases and therefore cannot be generalised. So I'm just going to quickly mention some other limitations and future directions for studies on individuals with acquired paedophilia and then I'm going to go into developmental paedophilia research. So there are a lot of factors that need to be controlled for in future studies, one of these being the forensic setting, whether you're an in or an outpatient in a forensic setting means that you may more likely have certain personality disorders or other comorbid psychology disorders that you wouldn't have if you were not in a forensic setting. Secondly, pharmacological treatment, whether individuals were on any medications, this should have been controlled for better as well. Also, the stimuli. So the type of stimuli and the variance between that needs to be reduced because some stimuli may be more effective at activating brain parts that have uh, are related to sexual arousal compared to others and also the duration that the stimuli are presented. As sexual arousal is a complex process, different brain areas might be activated at different times of the sexual arousal experience and therefore whether the image is shown for a short duration or a long duration may impact what brain areas are activated during the study. Okay, so now I'm going to look at the research of developmental paedophilia and hopefully we'll be able to distinguish the differences between the two a bit more. So individuals with developmental paedophilia have been seen to have disturbances with the way that they metabolise the chemical serotonin and serotonin is known as the happy chemical and is usually reduced in disorders such as anxiety and depression but in this case the abnormality of serotonin levels in the brain would increase aggression or just increase impulsive like behaviour which might explain this impulsive urge of sexual arousal towards children. The neurodevelopmental hypothesis for paedophilia suggests that these individuals may have abnormalities in the frontoexecutive part of their brain or the temporolimbic part of their brain. This means that they have a dysfunction in the reward system of the brain, so the association between a stimuli and the feeling of having a reward. So these alterations in these specific brain areas might be due to personal experiences that the individual has had at a young age, so this explains the uh, link between sex abuse or physical abuse they may have as a child and then the increased risk of having a paedophilic disorder and this might be due to the way that these brain regions develop. One study suggests that any kind of child abuse that was experienced at a young age impacts these executive functions that are related to how we cognitively interpret sexual arousal. One study that supports this hypothesis suggests that early childhood sexual abuse um, causes abnormalities in developing the temporal regions of your brain that are associated with sexual arousal and the frontal areas of the brain that are associated with how we cognitively interpret sexual desire and disinhibited behaviours. 
There's also some evidence for neural substrates that suggest that the usual mechanism that typical individuals experience when they have reduced sexual arousal for children is reversed for individuals who have developmental paedophilia. Obviously, this shows differences between those with paedophilia and typical individuals. However, whether these individuals are sex offenders or not really means that we can't apply all of this research to individuals with a paedophilic disorder in general and we need larger sample sizes. So now I'm going to very briefly talk about the therapeutic interventions that are available for these individuals. So, so far, psychodynamic therapies and cognitive behaviour therapy have shown some success in these individuals and it focuses specifically on uh, reducing cognitive distortions of sexual violence as well as changing their beliefs on sexual arousal. Also, there are relapse prevention interventions that are used to target the attitudes and beliefs towards sexual abuse. I think it's important to say that although I have mentioned that these therapies target um, distortions to abuse, a lot of these interventions are just trying to reduce the distress that individuals feel when they have an urge like this towards children because a lot of the individuals who need therapy will not act on these urges and just need to target techniques in order to reduce the distress of these urges. In some severe cases, some individuals might take some sort of medicinal intervention, which would be known as chemical castration. And this is a drug that reduces the libido and sexual arousal. However, this is not some sort of um, sterilization technique, it's simply to reduce the arousal that an individual feels. In some studies, it's been suggested that this drug alters the motivation response that we feel when we see uh, sexual stimuli, so for these individuals when they see stimuli of children. However, the results of this have been inconclusive, and although there might be some effects when you first start taking the drug, these responses soon decrease and are non-significant. So I know that was a lot of information. Hopefully it gave you a better understanding as to what it's like to have a paedophilic disorder. And I hope that you understand that in no way am I trying to demean the traumatic impact that abuse can have on victims. I am not trying to defend individuals who have offended in any way. And I am not trying to normalize the behavior of individuals who have this disorder. I'm simply trying to help you have a better understanding as to what the disorder is, the cause of it biologically, uh, the symptoms that it may have, the diagnostic criteria and the limitations in the research. If you have been triggered by this video in any way, as I have said earlier, I have included some support lines in the description below. I have also included all the research that I have mentioned in my video so that I can remain as transparent as possible. Thank you very much for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. And if you have any comments or any ideas of future videos that I should have, please comment below.